Hey, you remember that racing game that everyone was excited about a few years ago called The Crew? Remember how disappointed you were just like me? Yeah, that was a sad weekend. Ubisoft had gotten so formulaic with their video games that Assassin's Creed was leaking into literally everything else, including a racing game. Which ended up turning something so promising into something so wholly mediocre, but still featuring premium currency and other crap that you usually don't want in a game that you paid full price for. You can easily distill what's wrong with this game into a few major areas, and then you can see why this skid mark of a title isn't just about itself, but also the implications of the game's genre as a whole. First part is a story, I know, story in a racing game, not exactly punching at our weight, but still. Everybody loves a good beatdown every now and again. Every single character presented in the crew is extremely annoying at best and make me close the application on my computer at worst. I had zero connection to Booker DeWitt, I mean, uh, the leader of the Third Street Saints, or, uh, whoever this guy is supposed to be. Pair that with all the extremely annoying people that keep on shouting in my ear whenever I'm trying to drive about how I'm not in first place all the time, or okay, you're in first place, but I'm still going to nag at you. And eventually you're gonna end up just taking off your headset or muting the TV, however you're playing this thing. The overall plot of this thing is unnecessarily elaborate for the subject matter we're doing, and you're so busy actually trying to race and trying to skip these stupid cutscenes that you forget about it anyway. I'm pretty sure there was something to do with a kid in a revenge story, but you know, I really just wasn't there. I was trying to just get to the finish line. You know what game had a great story for it? Need for Speed Underground 2. It can be summarized with this. Oh, hey, bro, I see you moved to a new city, but you totally wrecked your car. It's okay, we'll spot you one and let you into our racing community. Have fun! You know what the best racing game story was? Gran Turismo. It goes like this. Oh, hey, bro, you want to race? Okay, let's go race. A few races later. Hey, bro, we saw you racing and you were really good. You want to come race with us in our better track? Okay, cool, let's go race. And that is all there was. That is all you need in a racing game. This game also makes a terrible first impression with its tutorial. After sitting through the opening cutscene, you're forced to do tutorials out of context for every race mode one after another and you start to wonder, hey, why the heck do we have a dirt mode and a raid mode? Why not just have one? Why not just have raid be dirt mode and then not have the other mode? Same goes with street mode versus perf mode. It's what, are we doing bolt-on mods versus stage three stuff on the street for some reason? Why do we need to have a differentiation? Why can't I do street races in a GT500? I'm pretty sure I'd win. And having all the tutorials for all the race modes one after another just makes zero sense when you're not even going to encounter most of these for hours. You have to get all the way to Las Vegas before you so much as do raid, which is the first serious departure from just basic racing. Street, perf, and dirt modes all really are just get from A to B following a certain track. Now, I'd love to show you all this and show you how stupid it is, but What's really stupid about the crew is you can't start over. Your save file persists no matter what, and unless you want to commit some serious game surgery going out and deleting certain files, you can't start this game over and replay the beginning missions, like the very beginning stuff, or the uh, opening sequence outside of like cinematics libraries. I don't know why they did this. I don't know why they would think that people want to start over in any sort of thing. Heck, any persistent world game like uh, World of Warcraft or EVE, if you really wanted to, you can start fresh. Just make a new character, go straight back to Elwyn Forest. We don't care, it's your game. It makes no sense not to include the option to start a new game, even if you are paying for these cars with your fun bucks you pay real money for just cordon those cars off until the point in the game where we can access them and then okay here's your car bucko now how about we talk about the cars so you get to pick your own car when you first start out and then you can buy other ones with money if you don't need them to participate in a new form of race this is all fine and good especially since you can end up tuning a car anyway to the point of where you never need to change your starting vehicle to get through the game except how stupid the upgrade system is. You get upgrades either by winning races, which is plausible, or for doing random challenges in the middle of the road. Okay, how on earth does doing a moose test in excess of 120 miles an hour on the freeway do anything other than destroy my alignment? 
I'd almost be willing to forgive a few of these if they were a bit better done. For instance, the outrun or drive in a straight line would be great if the cars just handled a bit better. And then there's a horrible faux pas that are the jump challenges. You know, normally I'm all about seeing how far I can possibly gun my car off of some sort of ramp in a racing game, but when the ramps are so obfuscated and you're driving through the thing thinking, okay, there's a ramp, where's the ramp? Oh my God, is that the ramp? No, that's not the ramp. You just hit a center divider. And then you always end up course correcting and not getting it right the first time that forces you to retry the challenge if you want to get a good score, but it resets you not far back enough to get to top speed, which you're going to need in order to get the top score. Oh, here's my favorite part. All your upgrades is not like, okay, you got this and it does that. No, it's plus six to engine core. Whatever that means. It's like, what? Uh, I look this up and it's like, okay, so there's engine core is in a core charge, which is something that you're being made to pay for if you ever buy a part that you can have theoretically reassembled, say like an engine or a transmission, but you don't see yourself modifying the physical center of your engine. None of these upgrades make sense and there's no excuse for this kind of crap, especially when this game had decades of established racing games to build off. Why not we just say, okay, you helped a mysterious elf in his windowless van find his lost puppy and he gave you a mithril engine block for your trouble. Now you have a significant weight reduction and also your engine can take a lot more force in it. Okay, so I'm trying to get this video to reach a certain length, but I just can't find anything else to complain about this game that isn't mediocre and nitpicking. So I'm gonna do something that actually enriches your life and gives you positivity, because I feel my channel's been too negative. I'm gonna teach you how to make the best grilled cheese you have ever had. Step one, bread. You want something that's kind of spongy and not too dry. I like this brand here. After that, you're gonna need to have something between the bread and the pan. Do not use spray. Do not try to spread butter onto your bread and have it get all messed up. Do not try warmed butter. You gotta melt that stuff and then baste it on. Minimum of one basting, maximum of three. Once you have that all set, you're also gonna wanna grate some Parmesan. That's gonna come into play later. Turn on your pan. Use a small pan so that you don't have to wait for it to heat up or worry about heat distribution. Only one sandwich at a time, please. Now that we've got our bread and our Parmesan ready, it's time to get the actual cheese. I'd suggest either a mild or medium cheddar, or if you're in a bind, American. You want something that's not too intense, but also has a nice low melting point so you can get that gooey effect if you're shooting for it. Okay, here's what we do. We take our buttered bread, we cover that side with some butter with our Parmesan, then we slap that down on the pan. We don't have to worry about spray, the butter is gonna do its job, and the leftover is going to give you a wonderful golden crust. Now, while we're having the bread heat up, put your cheese on top of the bread and then put the other slice on there, butter it up just like you did the first slice, and then put the Parmesan on. Wait two, maybe three minutes because you want nothing more than medium heat on this sucker, and then flip it, wait another two or three minutes, you're done. In the meantime, while you're making those sandwiches, you're gonna want something to dip these bad boys in. I'd suggest a tomato bisque, but I'd like to remind you, this is not binging with Babish. Just go buy that stuff from the store and put it on a low heat so it's nice and simmery by the time your food is ready. Make a few of these, and suddenly all your incel friends are gonna be downing if you're one of them. Okay, back to the video. And what's really fun about this upgrade system is there are random modifiers, because that's exactly what I look for when I'm tuning my car. The element of randomness when I'm about to take this highly specified racing vehicle onto a track or into a street race. And while we're still on the subject of cars, the lack of attention to detail is intense. For instance, I'm a big fan of Mustangs. I know what certain Mustangs sound like, and I can tell you, that the 1965 GT500 did not sound the same as I believe it's a 2011 Mark V Mustang that they use as a starter car, which does not sound the same as the 2013 GT500 off the Trinity block, which does not sound the same as the Fastback that came out in 2015. All these cars use the exact same sound bite for their engine. And if that's how they treat the Mustangs in those cars, how do they treat all the other cars? 
I don't want to find out. I don't want to invest any more time in this game than I have to. I get the feeling, especially for the base stats of the full stock cars, that they pretty much just read stuff off charts and looked at pictures, which to be fair, they don't exactly have an unlimited budget, but I can't help but notice that the Shelby GT500 for the 2013 edition could get up to exactly 202 miles per hour, which while I am a big Shelby fanboy, I have to admit, they never actually prove that top speed. Some guys in Italy just said they did it. This lack of attention to detail spills over into the world. If you ever tried to just drive somewhere in the crew, you'll notice that there's a whole lot of nothing going on in between the major areas. Entire multi-million population cities and even several states have been scooped out of the continental United States. And it's just weird. There's nothing for so long of a stretch. Like there's no gas stations, no markets, no, there's nothing other than like abandoned industrial buildings, landmarks, and the occasional house. It's weird, you also don't see any of these things inside of the major cities. All these people with all these cars, but not a single fuel pump around. I know it's nitpicking, but it really pulls you out of the game. Then there's the matter of the little things in cities. I can tell you right now, I would not recommend trying to drive to your hometown in the crew unless you live in one of the major city centers. I did it. I was sorely disappointed and thoroughly convinced that the development team for this game used Google Images as their research tool. For instance, Laguna Beach, where I spent a lot of my childhood, is nothing more than a completely flat area with that one motor hotel and a couple shacks. Yeah, never mind the topography of the region, never mind that Laguna Beach is at the opening of a canyon, Never mind that it seems that these guys from France only knew stuff they had seen from reality TV shows concerning anything in California that was outside of Los Angeles and San Francisco. You're also not going to have a whole lot to listen to in the crew either as you drive. I've only ever heard a handful of songs in it, and one of the things you really, 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 really need in your racing game is an awesome soundtrack. A soundtrack can make your game. I don't think Gran Turismo would have been half as popular as it was if it didn't have that soundtrack. And look at other games like the Midnight Club franchise and the original Need for Speed games. Those introduce so many of us to so many different songs and so many different genres. And it's always just a memorable song that you can just fly down the highway in. And in the crew, you just get this kind of background stuff. It really, I feel like maybe they cheaped out on budget and couldn't buy any of the licensing rights to big major songs or have enough resources to go find good indie talent to put in their game. So they just settled for somebody's nephew or something that's in a garage band. I guess none of this really matters though, because if you really wanted to, you can just automatically fast travel to your garage, fast travel using the airplane system to wherever you need to be, and for a game that emphasizes that you have the entire contiguous United States to travel across and find all sorts of secrets with your little Assassin's Creed satellites, you really don't have to see much. And there's no excuse for this because you can do an open world or something similar to an open world pretty well in racing. Just look at Need for Speed Underground 2. Everything was just sort of laid out, you eventually got access to other areas, and it was rewarding to go and explore the nooks and crannies. There weren't like weird challenges or constantly tugging at your sleeve like, oh, go look at this thing. Go look at this derelict hoopty mobile. Go look at this. Go see this landmark. None of that was present in those games, but it still did a great job of making the world feel like something you could drive around in and have a great time. So why does any of this matter? Why does this crappy, very disappointing, pay to play and then pay some more for some cars that we might have been sponsored to put in matter? Well, because some of the elements we found in the crew are seeping into other racing games. Many racing games are now requiring useless, always online connectability. Other racing games like that god awful Need for Speed reboot had random part bonuses through loot boxes of all things. And not even Gran Turismo is safe from the general drop in variety of cars 
that the crew made popular through upgrades and showing off supercars. What if I don't want to race a supercar? What if I want to hoon around in one of those panther bodies you keep showing me? I just keep imagining one of those is a secret Mercury Marauder I can go take out on the road. But no, I can't. Although, Forza, thank you. Thank you for putting in the Crown Victoria. That was cool of you. All the cars in your racing game don't need to be ridiculous softcore F1 barely street legal vehicles. Sometimes you just want to dick around. Sometimes you want to take a crappy Honda Prelude and stage three that thing into a track monster. But the AAA companies that make racing games are ignoring that and just going for the big brand name race cars that are cool to put on posters, but in the end, a lot of them drive the same because there's only so much you can do at a certain point with all that power and handling. And speaking of race games in the future, The Crew 2 is coming out, which is partly why I made this video, if we're being honest. But I'm gonna call this right now. The Crew 2 is gonna have more out of place Assassin's Creed style garbage laying around it, constantly tugging at your sleeve, trying to get you to go look at a thing or go find a tower that has everything except the eagle in order to find your map. Because we all know that if we ever want our Google Maps or Apple Maps to work, we have to go find a cell tower and hijack it to get the local air also, I bet a couple weeks after The Crew 2 comes out to mediocre review, somebody's gonna go digging through the files and find the remains of a loot box system that was probably hastily scrapped after the massive backlash that happened with Star Wars Battlefront 2 Remake. Or, it's just gonna be overtly in there, but it's gonna be so bad that hardly anyone covers it. There will also be even more, you can only buy these with real money cars that no one's gonna care about, but now there's gonna be boats and stuff too, and other vehicles that we just do not care about that are obviously paying Ubisoft a bit to get their vehicle prominently featured in game. And lastly, I bet there's going to be some features stopping edgelords from trying to fly their planes into buildings. Calling it now, that has to happen. Thank you so much for watching this. Feel free to subscribe, feel free to Discord, feel free to Patreon. Actually, yes, please Patreon me. I like money. There's not much more to say here as I'm rushing this recording in order to make sure that the cold that is floating around my community again does not get to me and I have everything done. See you later. Enjoy the credits and cat video. Where did I? You're not even in the box. You were under it. What are you doing? What's good? Can't hide from me now. You know, you just mess around with stuff like this, but we buy you actual toys, you know? But I guess you can't run your paws across the smooth surface of this thing, because it has no smooth surfaces. At least you're actually getting inside the box now. You know, I'll just leave you to it. <laughs>